When they arrived, they saw a note written by Julie Schenecker on the door, chewing away the ride chair. There was a carpool. And she had on the note that the family had gone out of town and they wouldn't be in the carpool that day. So she intentionally chewed away or diverted the carpool. When police got in, they found Julie Schenecker lounging beside her gorgeous pool in her house robe, splattered in her own children's blood. The defense is legal insanity. But what prosecutors will do to try to prove that she knew right from wrong, she knew what she was doing, that she's guilty of murder, is take a look at all the things that she did, the steps that she took to commit the killings, and what it takes to do those things, and what her mental state would have been in order to accomplish all that. Let's bring back in the Dream Team as we walk through some of these steps. And it all begins, Mike, with the gun. I mean, Julie Schenker bought the gun a week beforehand. So is she in this this uh, legally insane state for a week, and wouldn't other people notice? Yeah, you, uh, you would think that they would, Vinny. She went out and bought the Smith & Wesson bodyguard revolver. She had to buy ammo for that gun also. And uh, so she, I, I think she knew exactly what she was doing. Yeah, here's she the, re here's the receipt for the gun, so they're able to prove when it was purchased and everything else, able yeah. to use a credit card uh, to purchase it. And uh, Darren Cavanoke, that's a big part of what prosecutors do in cases like this, is say, hey, she did this, that, and the other thing. One of those things was she planned it because she went out and bought the gun a week ahead of time. And for that whole week, I mean, people saw her and interacted with her, and they didn't notice anything right. was wrong with her. There was no breakdown. Right. Of course, but from a defense perspective, I think what they would need to point out is that a purchase of a gun can happen for many reasons, innocent reasons, other than just planning uh, uh, to kill yeah, your okay. kids. Okay. And, that, and that the break happened later. But sadly, Vinny, you know, this, this idea of filicide, moms killing their kids, happens with greater regularity than people like to contemplate. It's the most horrific of crimes and happens a couple hundred times a year in the United States. Unfortunately. Now we take a look at what else uh, she did beforehand. And this is a big part of it. I wonder how it plays. You're talking about the beer. You're talking about the wine. Uh, she was talking about some medications as well. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is it is it a mental breakdown or is it, you know, three bottles of Heineken and a couple of bottles of wine, Mike? Liquid courage, you know, to, uh, to go ahead and mm -hmm. carry out this. But... Uh, uh, but it sounds like she had uh, substance abuse problems before this. I, you talked about AA, she talked about rehab, if all those stories are, in fact, true. That's not going to help her defense. No. I mean, voluntary intoxication. You get right. drunk, you know you're on medication, and it makes you do things outside of your, your norm. That's not anybody's fault but yours. And one of the other strange things in this case are the Post-it notes that are left all around the house, like this one by the plate of her daughter's food. And on the note, it, it talks about how um, her daughter didn't want to eat the French chicken dinner that she had cooked. And remember, the whole alleged motive here is that the teens weren't acting properly. They were mouthing and talking back to her. Jay Bear, how do the post-its play inside the courtroom? Does that, does that show insanity or, or does that show uh, a motive? I think it's going to go directly to her state of mind, and that's what the jury is going to be looking at, is what was her state of mind at the time this incident took place. All right. It starts Monday, folks. All